Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to service at worship at Countryside Church. My name is Tim Reuter Bowers. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a member of your board of trustees. We are an intentionally inclusive congregation. We affirm the individual journey. We covenant our shared journey. We honor differences and we celebrate diversity. All are welcome. Please read the blue insert inside your order of worship and the weekly email updates for news of all of our activities and events. But I would like to share a couple of things. Uh, first, as a reminder, the Cook, Cody, uh, Cook County's current COVID level is medium. So masks are optional except when singing. Also, we'd like you to know that the Chicago area UU Council will be holding its in-person and online winter conference on Saturday, January 28th from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at Countryside. The conference keynote presentation is titled Finding Our Center, a journey to the central values the Article II Study Commission have presented for our consideration. Uh, details and registration can be found at uuchicagoarea.org or you can see Mike Gilley after service in Atherton Hall. To all Soul Connection participants and anyone else who's just interested, if you did not already attend the Soul Connections orientation meeting that was held on December 18th, then please do plan to attend the Soul Connections orientation after church today at 1130 in the Stokes Conference Room. Carol Swigert, who has a history with Soul Connections, will give us an overview of the program and getting us moving, to getting us moving toward its intentionality. Plan to see you there. Finally, as hopefully most of you know, CCUU worship is now on YouTube. If you have not already subscribed, please do so, because once we get 100 subscribers, it opens up other features that are not available to us now. Newcomers, visitors, friends, and members are all welcome at events. Newcomers, please stop to meet our greeters at the kinship table just inside Atherton Hall across from the sanctuary after this morning service during fellowship. We would love to get to know more about you. Again, welcome. We're glad you decided to spend this Sunday morning with us. Good morning. I'm Reverend Denise Cauley. My pronouns are she and her, and I have the president of the Board of Trustees with me, Tom Dempsey. Yeah. And it's the new year. Yeah. Happy Yay. New year. Happy, happy new year. Well, we wanted to take a moment to chat with you because we get to do that. And we wanted to talk about something new we tried this year. What did we try this year, Tom? Giving Tuesday. Yes, and we needed more than one Tuesday. So it turned into Giving December. Yeah, the Giving Tuesday. This was a new concept we'd never done before when uh, we were first. Closer. Uh, I don't use the mic. There you go. Oh, there yeah, we go. Yeah. Um, so when uh, we were first meeting Reverend Denise, she said, have you ever done Giving Tuesday before? And we said, no, we know what it is. But uh, she introduced us to this concept. and. Uh, was uh, a little late in the fall, like at the fall board meeting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the November board meeting. I said, "Aren't we gonna, you know, to ask for some money? Don't don't all churches do that? Don't don't all congregations have an end of the year campaign? And aren't we really really worried about money? Why are we worried about money, Tom? Hard to say. <laughs> We've been worried because um, one of the things that happens in an interim time is we take a look at the whole congregation and things that maybe we kind of forgot about for a while. And one of those areas was how employee, employee benefits are supposed to be done and making everyone have the same benefits and things like that. And we have so much support from the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association, where they do tons of demographics for us. 
take in the area. They give us all kinds of charts and stuff about what things are supposed to be like. So that was one big area that we were behind on. We're actually still in the process of working that out the way it should be. And then there was one other area that we were really concerned about. Well, um, we discovered in the search process that we were severely behind the eight ball in terms behind the norm in terms of our staff benefits things like retirement insurance etc so um, this was the year that we've caught up and completely gotten ourselves up to standard with that yeah and then we also have a water heater that just is a pr in the process of going out and commercial water heaters are like 10 times what our home ones are who knew right so there were a lot of good reasons to play with that. So we, we asked y'all for some money, and um, we've got some news. So do you want to so review? So we assembled a team uh, yeah. to work with Reverend Denise and to point people on that were Tim Reuterbauer's Dan Yokas and Emily Cheng. And you know, you wonder when you do something new, is there even going to be any participation? Some of us worry more than others. So when those first dollars came in on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, yes, I worry more than others. Um, you know, you wonder, is this going to go anywhere? We got a little bit of a late start, and, uh, you know, but uh, those uh, contributions. So we have at least 63 cents in. or $63? These are dollars. All right, all right, These that's dollars. good. I think we've got 71 cents in there somewhere. Yeah, and but, uh, as we hit various thresholds, you know, four thousand, five thousand, I thought, well, my goodness, this is really going some. Yeah, but Tom, Tom continued to remain dubious even after we got the, the the one total on Tuesday. He still said, I don't know why it worked, and I went, I do, right? But our goal was twenty thousand, and we're here today to give you our total. <laughs> Now, this is good enough and way better than some of us thought it was going to be, but there are gifts that we've received from people who actually donated their stock to us. This is several thousand dollars, but it hasn't been cashed in yet. It doesn't include this. Also, everyone was so generous on um, Christmas Eve, so even in the midst of giving December, we had a great... Um, contribution to the minister's discretionary fund. I have um, almost $2,500 that I can use to help pay people's insurance. I paid car insurance last month for someone. We paid a portion of rent, that's right, for someone. Someone had a surgery and needed help with all the medical supplies that they were required to have after. So y'all have been so generous. We can't thank you enough. So there's still much work to do, as we have been saying all along since this time last year. Um, there are just so many needs that, that we've got to come up to speed with. There's going to be extra search, uh, uh, expenses with the search process that we're going to be in next year. Things come up like the hot water heater. It's not a time to relax. It's not a time to sit on our laurels. But it is a time to celebrate what a small, dedicated group of people did so please give yourself a big round of applause. And we're really moving out of a scarcity mentality into one of abundance. And how do we fund our mission? And what would Countryside look like if we were truly operating from a point of this is our mission and this is what we want to do? And so we want to start to talk about our stories differently. And today we have a a big start to that. So whenever a congregation exists, there's actually always work that the congregation does different from the work the minister does or the staff. And even though we've been starting on some of that work in the fall, today is our first like opener to the interim transitions work. And so after service today, we're going to do the first storytelling with that. And um, Tom's going to invite up some of the five people who are helping to guide that right now. So this is the interim transitions team, the work team that's going to be 
guiding this process through the years, so we want to introduce all five of them to you. Uh, three are right up here, I think. Doreen Bryant, Judy Ball, Lisa like Christensen. Stand up so everyone knows who you are, because we don't want to yeah. assume. Why don't you come up next to Rev D? Yeah. Jerome McDonald yep. and Bill Huber. Yep. So they're Learn helping Bill. us. Um, this is the interim transitions team. So they're going to help the congregation guide through their work. And you know, one of the signs of intelligence is being able to look past, present, and future. And that starts today with looking at the past. So we're gonna have a storytelling session after service. We have chairs set up in Atherton, so go get your coffee and snacks and sit down in a grouping. One of these people will be up there. We have some questions that we're gonna ask you. And you'll see for the next two months or so, we're gonna talk a lot about stories of countryside. And new people, you are absolutely supposed to be a part of this. I wanna be clear, even if you just came today for the first time, Part of us tuning up our intelligence, making sure we don't repeat mistakes of the past, making sure we do repeat wondrous things of the past, is reviewing our history. So there are five areas of interim ministry, and one of the first is history and storytelling. So I am delighted. This is a dynamic, amazing team that I get to work with. And I want to be super clear, they're not here to do the work for you. They are here to help you do the work of interim ministry, right? So there's congregational work. We are blessed with this team. There's a couple people who are thinking about joining us still. But um, what a gift it is to have these people who know so many of the stories. So thank you very much. And please come after service. It will not be boring. So I will hand it over to the team now. Hi, my name is Alex Myron, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm part of our senior high youth group here at Countryside. Today's call to worship is The Imprint of Love by Laura Horton Ludwig. Spirit of life and love, light within and without, mystery from which we have all emerged, within which we live and die. Be with us now as we allow ourselves to drop into the silence and stillness at the center of our being. As people of faith, we seek to live in a spirit of love, 
a spirit of community, justice, and peace. And yet, in so many corners of the world, both far and near, we see divisiveness and hate. If we look deep within ourselves, perhaps we will even find those shadow energies there too. We struggle to respond to the outer world and our inner dramas in ways that manifest love. At times, we may fear that love will not be strong enough. At times, we may question whether love really is at the root of all things in this world with so much struggle and suffering and discord. We may struggle to hold on to our faith in love, knowing that if all things come from one source we proclaim, that source must somehow hold hate as well as love, violence as well as peace, evil as well as good. This is the mystery within which we live and die. These are the questions that haunt our days and nights. And yet, we are not without hope. Our struggles and our questions testify to our longing for peace, for love. Our very longings are born out of that mystery. We dare to address a spirit of life and love. In the stillness and silence of our own heart, we read the imprint of love, created not by our own will, but planted there for us to discover. By what or whom, we cannot know. And yet, it is there. A clue, a talisman, a beacon, a light within. May it keep hope alive even as we dwell in mystery. May it guide us all as we seek to act wisely and well. May it help us to be vessels of compassion for one another and for our world. Good morning. Happy New Year. I'm Mike Pennock. My pronouns are he, him. I am genuinely happy to be here this morning and see everybody again. I missed everybody. Our chalice lighting this morning is by Reverend Joan Johnson Lewis. It is called In Touch with Those Unique Lights of Our Own Being. As we light our chalice this week, we imagine the light that shines within each of us. We each have intention, we each have experience, we each have thoughts, we each have feelings, we each have wisdom. May this flame remind us to be in touch with those best and most unique lights of our own being and to bring them into this room today and, to, and into all that we do in this world. Please rise as you are able and willing and sing with us, number 391, Voice Still and Small.
please remain standing as we say our covenant together. We unite to strengthen the bonds of kinship among all persons, to promote human dignity, and to increase reverence for life creating, sustaining, and transforming power through worship, study, and service. Our theme this month is finding your center. It's a good thing to find at the beginning of the year. And if we find it well, it might last. And so today we're going to um, do a little exercise that will include you. We are going to, the choir will be singing, and our Tai Chi master, Leslie Peet, will be, <laughs> will be leading us and some Tai Chi. Mostly what I want you to concentrate on is being here, clearing your mind, and breathing. You will see movements that will make you want to breathe collectively. Taking a breath, inhaling, and exhaling. And so follow along with that. And she will also be doing movements which in Tai Chi help to clear and, uh, certain areas of the body to bring better health. Uh, for instance, one of the movements a lot with the, with the breathing and also the stretching movement helps to uh, the lungs. It opens the lungs, which our lungs can hold despair, sadness, and depression opening leads to courage. There's a movement to clear the liver, which holds anger, and when we open it, it lets in generosity. There's a movement that will clear the kidneys, because our kidneys hold fear, and when we open, it lets in calmness. There's a movement for the heart, which holds impatience, and when we open, we let in love, joy, and happiness. There's a movement for the spleen and pancreas, which holds worry and anxiety. And as we open, we let in fairness, openness, and trust. We let in, uh, we, we clear the upper, middle, and lower cavities with a movement that goes for all triple areas. And it uh, circulates our chi and our fluids. So breathe with us. And at the end, could we sit in silence for about 10 or 15 seconds and just absorb?
Our first story today is called The Kindness of Lomain by the Reverend Karen Solvig Anderson. My friend Marcy and her boyfriend Brian recently ate dinner at a local Chinese restaurant. As they enjoyed a plate of lo mein, engrossed in conversation, a hand reached down and ushered away their platter of noodles. A voice, quick and agitated, mumbled, sorry, and a thin, poorly dressed woman left the restaurant with their plate of lo mein. In astonishment, they watched her walk down the street, holding the plate with the flat of her hand as she stuffed noodles into her mouth, slapping sharply against her face. The owner realized what had happened and darted out the front door, chasing after the noodle thief. He stood firmly in front of her, blocking her way and grabbing the side of the plate. A struggle ensued. Noodles slid uneasily from one side to the other, slopping over the edge. He surged forward and pulled with a heroic strong arm attempt to retrieve his plate. The woman's fingers slid from the plate. Noodles flew, then flopped pathetically on the sidewalk. Left empty-handed, with soggy, contaminated noodles at her feet, the woman stood, with arms hung dejectedly at her side. The owner walked victoriously back to the restaurant with the soiled plate in his hand. My friends were given a new heaping plate of lo mein, although they had already consumed half of the stolen plate. A stream of apology in Chinese came from the proprietor. Unable to eat anymore, they asked to have the noodles wrapped up and set off to see their movie. A block later, they happened upon the Lomain thief. The woman was hypercharged. She simultaneously cried, convulsed, and shouted at a man who rapidly retreated from her side. My friend, unsure about what to do, listened to her boyfriend's plea to just walk away. But she didn't. Instead, she walked over to the thief and said, Ah, uh, we haven't formally met, but about ten minutes ago, you were interested in our noodles. They gave us some new ones. Are you still hungry? The woman nodded and extended her bony arms. She took the styrofoam container in her hands, bowed ever so slightly, and murmured, Thank you. You're very kind. What makes us walk away from discomfort? Or stay? You could say a lot about my friend's story. A lot about generosity, kindness, attention, and thievery. I'm more interested in what motivates us to confront that, that which makes us uncomfortable and makes us look at the guts and grits of decisions, the choices to not address things that are uncomfortable, uneasy, unbalanced, unnatural, unbelievable. When our foundations start to shake, we can feel the tremors move up our legs and into our torsos, and we want more than anything to make it stop, anyhow, anyway. My friend Marcy could feel herself shake. I know because she told me so, but she chose not to walk away. She dealt with uncomfortableness. She held firm in the muck. Sometimes that's all we need or can do to get to the other side, the side where generosity, comfort, and kindness reside, the side where foundations are firm and stable, where one shaking walks back to the other side. Please rise in body or spirit and join in singing hymn number 123, Spirit of Life. Oh, oh. 
Good morning. I am Mary Lamb Sheldon, she, her, your Director of Lifespan Religious Education here at Countryside. I've titled my remarks this morning, Tending the Inner Teacher. And I want to start by saying a little bit about what I mean by inner teacher. In the story Alex just shared, the author, Reverend Karen Anderson, is curious about what us allows us to stay in discomfort, to attend to what is within us and act accordingly, rather than follow the more comfortable route toward some unexamined norm. Some might call that thing in this story Marcy's conscience or her intestinal fortitude, and many might say she was attending to her inner teacher, even perhaps as she was facing an outward one. The wise teacher, sage, or mentor is an archetype a recurring, deeply ingrained element of myth, legend, and fable, and so pervasive in our stories that it is widely thought to represent something fundamental to human experience and personality. So take a moment to notice. When I use the words wise teacher or sage, what image springs to mind? Do you see Gandalf or Dumbledore? Maybe Yoda or Obi-Wan. Maybe you see LeVar Burton or Rita Moreno or Mr. Hooper from Sesame Street. Maybe Neil deGrasse Tyson or Ruth Bader Ginsburg. My inner teacher often appears to me as my grade school science teacher, Rita Taylor, who was, as it happens, also a UU. The sage is one of Carl Jung's 12 major archetypes manifesting in an individual as they successfully mature, but also widely visible in the culture and throughout a person's lifetime. Joseph Campbell identifies the appearance of the mentor as an identifiable stage in the hero's journey, which he understood to be a kind of underlying form or template giving rise to diverse legends throughout history and across the globe. The particular Manifestation varies widely, but the form or role in our stories is commonplace. Significantly to us this morning, Campbell used the hero's journey to compare different religions and their scriptural stories in which the wise teacher makes frequent appearance. And again, Campbell seeks the wise, sees the wise teacher in myth and fable as representing something fundamental inside us something not only about the human experience, but also personality. While the importance of the figure of the inner teacher has been widely acknowledged by important thinkers over many centuries, by everyone from Socrates to Brene Brown, there are significant differences in how they conceive of it, especially in terms of where it resides or where it comes from. Many UUs know about the inner teacher through the beloved educator Parker Palmer, who conceives of the wise teacher as a representation of the inner divine, a sort of spiritual conception of it as innate to humans. Socrates, in contrast, whom some credit with the first uh, naming of this figure, thought of it as simply the sum total of his own wisdom, a more psychological concept of it as acquired. I think it's helpful to understand that we need not believe in God, that is God the Father, or even God as something else altogether. We, not, we, we need not believe in God to appreciate the importance of the inner teacher. Belief in God or a soul or spirit is not antithetical to, but is not necessary for understanding this figure. And we can think of it as either innate to us or as acquired over time or both. It puts me in mind of a friend, a UU, who, having begun a 12-step program and needing to describe her higher power to her group, decided to use her own Catholic confirmation name as, her, as the name for her higher power. I always thought this a beautiful representation of how the inner teacher is both inherent and received. Maybe you're already acquainted with your inner teacher. Maybe you're already fast friends. 
Or maybe you've never imagined them, but as part of our service today, I'd like to offer an exercise, a brief guided meditation, to help you meet them. You can think of this meeting as divination to help you discern the future, which is traditional for this time of year, or just as an inward reflection on your life adventure, a way of representing yourself to yourself. If you would, please just sit facing forward in your seat with your arms and legs in a relaxed position and close your eyes, or if you prefer, lower your eyelids to look at a spot on the floor or a seat back in front of you. Then please just pay attention to your breathing as you inhale and exhale. And notice for a moment how your breath sustains you, whether you are paying attention to it or not. And allow yourself to experience gratitude for this natural rhythm of your life. We're going to take a little journey together in our minds. So I want you to know that if you end up someplace you don't like, don't stay there. Go somewhere else in your mind, someplace that makes you happy, or come on back to this room and open your eyes. Now with eyes closed or lids lowered, picture a place of learning. It can be indoors or outside. It can be a place you know, or a place of your imagination. It should be a place where you feel relatively free to be yourself. A place where you can share your imperfections and challenges. Now picture in this place a teacher. The teacher may be there already or arrive shortly. They may be older or younger than you. Someone you've known, living or dead, or someone of your imagination. They should be someone with whom you feel ready to learn. Introduce yourself to your teacher let them know you are glad to be here in this place of learning together. Now let your teacher know that you are thinking about the year just passed and the year to come. Take a moment to reflect on how your year has been and what may be coming to you in 2023. Now ask your teacher for a word that will help guide you in the coming year. They might write it on a chalkboard, in the sand, the snow, or whisper it in your ear. However they deliver it, once you have received your word, Thank your teacher for this gift and for meeting with you in this place. Know that you can return to this place of learning any time you wish to visit with them. Then when you're ready, recall this sanctuary. Feel the support of the chair beneath you and open your eyes. I'd like you to take a moment to turn to someone near you, maybe one or two other people near you. You don't have to share anything if you don't want to about your place of learning or your teacher or your word, though you can if you wish to. But regardless, maybe just share a little bit about how it was to do this exercise. Was it easy? Happy? Was it challenging in some way? We'll take two minutes total for this 
quiet conversation. Again, one or two other people, and if you need a partner, just raise your hand and we'll find you one. I'll ring the bell once at a minute, and then again once the two minutes are complete. Go. Friends at home, you can enter something in the chat box about your teacher if you want to. Make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. I hope our friends at home heard that we would love to see what they have to say about their experience or their inner teacher in the chat box. So now, perhaps you've met your inner teacher, or sage, or mentor. Meditation is one way to reach this important figure, but it's also possible to access and cultivate them in other ways. One of these is in quiet conversation with others, and there are ample opportunities for such conversations here in this congregation, where we proclaim study to be part of our covenant with one another. I want to let you know that, as I have done similar reflection with the youth of this church, they have reported to me significant learning experiences with other church members, their fellow young people, their teachers and other mentors, and other congregants they've encountered. This is sacred work, friends. What an honor it is to occupy the place of wise teacher in a child's mind. Our Sunday RE programs build very special relationships here, and our teachers bring wonderful gifts of learning and self-discovery to our kiddos. Our cohorts are growing this year's year, and it's an exciting time to be part of preschool through eighth grade on Sunday mornings and senior high youth group on Sunday evenings. I urge you, if you haven't already, to enroll your young people to participate. Our congregation also offers many opportunities to foster such quiet conversations that tend to inner teacher for adults. So many, really. Three different book groups, the Forum, Buddhism Study Group, Atheists, Humanists, and Agnostics, Transitions. I imagine there will be opportunities to call on your inner teacher at the CCUU storytelling session following worship today. I want to bring special attention to two opportunities coming right up. First of all, Rick Rayborn, where are you? Rick is raising his hand, so turn around to see him, please. I want to thank Rick Rayborn for reconvening our Soul Connections small group ministries. Thank you, Rick. And Carol Swigert for offering some training and facilitation. Thank you. Much appreciated. 
These groups, yeah. These groups are just about to convene, and if you've been waiting to jump in, reach out to Rick right after worship today to find your group. Another opportunity coming up a week from today is our Spirit of Life series, which I am so excited to be leading. This series will meet Sundays following worship, carefully avoiding meetings related to our interim work. The Spirit of Life series offers participants space, time, and community to explore their Unitarian Universalist spirituality, focusing each week on a different aspect framed by the lyrics of Carolyn McDade's beloved hymn that we just sung, Spirit of Life. The series is designed to be welcoming to Unitarian Universalists of many and any spiritual and theological persuasion, and participants are invited to claim an inclusive definition of spirituality. Reflecting, speaking, and listening are core activities in each workshop, perfect for tending the inner teacher inside you. Maybe for some of us, maybe especially for those of us who think of our beloved community as our higher power, or who think of God as love itself, our inner teachers collectively, in conversation with one another, are a good way to think about the holy, or the divine, or God. My inner teacher teaches me, but also ultimately you. Your inner teacher teaches you, but also me. And though I'm definitely here to promote curricula and programs for the new year, I want to close my words today with this important thought. We are always, in everything we do here, teaching one another about what it means to be Unitarian Universalist whether in or out of class, in worship or in coffee hour, even at our annual meetings, we are teaching one another about our faith. May we proceed accordingly. May we tend our inner teachers, our own and one another's, so that wisdom guides our experience here with one another and peace finds a home in us. May that wisdom help us to move through discomfort toward respect, compassion, kindness, and love. And may we find ourselves centered, grounded, and prepared to face whatever the future may bring us. The Messiah is Among Us by Father Francis Dorff. A monastery had fallen on hard times. It was once part of a great order which, as a result of religious persecution, lost all its branches. It was decimated to the extent that there were only five monks left in the order, left in the mother house. The abbot and four others, all of whom were over 70, clearly it was a dying order. Deep in the woods surrounding the monastery was a little hut that the rabbi from a nearby town occasionally used for a hermitage. One day, it occurred to the abbot to visit the hermitage to see if the rabbi could offer any advice that might save the monastery. As he approached the hut, he saw the rabbi standing in the doorway as if he had been waiting the abbot's arrival, his arms outstretched in welcome. They embraced like long-lost brothers. The two entered the hut, where they sat quietly for a time, and then spoke quietly of deep things. The time came when the abbot had to leave. They embraced, and the rabbi said, You and your brothers are serving God with heavy hearts, he said. You have come to seek my counsel. I will give it to you, but you can repeat it only once. After that, no one must ever say it aloud again. The rabbi looked straight at the abbot and said, The Messiah is among you. For a while, all was silent. Then the rabbi said, Now you must go. And the abbot left without a word and without ever looking back. The next morning, the abbot called his monks together. He told them he had received counsel from the rabbi 
who walks in the woods, and that the teaching was never again to be spoken aloud. Then he looked at the group assembled, the group of assembled brothers, and said, The rabbi said that the Messiah is among us. The monks were startled by this declaration. When the other monks heard the rabbi's words, they wondered what possible significance they might have. The Messiah is among us? One of us here at the monastery? Do you suppose he meant the abbot? Of course, it must be the abbot, who has been a leader, our leader for so long. On the other hand, he might have meant Brother Thomas, who is undoubtedly a holy man. Certainly he couldn't have meant Brother Elrod. He's so crotchety. <laughs> but then, Elrod is very wise. Surely he could not have meant Brother Philip. He's too passive. But then, magically, he's always there when you need him. Of course, it, he didn't mean me. Yet, supposing he did. Oh, Lord, not me. I, I, I couldn't mean that much to you, could I? As they contemplated in this manner, the old monks began to treat each other with extraordinary respect. On the off chance that one of them might actually be the Messiah. And on the off chance that each monk find, uh, himself might be the Messiah, they began also to treat themselves themselves with extraordinary respect. Because the forest in which the monastery was situated was beautiful, people occasionally came to visit the monastery, to picnic or to wander among the old paths, most of which led to the dilapidated chapel. They sensed the aura of extraordinary respect that surrounded the five old monks, permeating the atmosphere. They began, they began to come more frequently, bringing their friends and their friends brought more friends. Some of the younger men who came to visit began to engage in conversation with the monks. After a while, one asked if he might join, then another and another. Within a few years, the monastery became once again a thriving order. And thanks to the rabbi's gift, a vibrant community of light and love. Now is the time in our service that we set aside to share in the communal ritual of giving. Our congregation is funded entirely by pledges and contributions from you, our beloved members and friends. Giving helps us feel more generous and it shows your support for our congregational life. See the screen or the order of worship for several ways to donate. And if this is your first time worshiping with us, please let the basket pass you by as your presence is gift enough.
Our chalice extinguishing and benediction is by the Reverend Patrice Curtis. You, yes, you right there, you reading or hearing this. You are the spirit of the holy, face of the sacred, your frail, strong human body, the universe manifest. I give my thanks for you. I turn my face and hand towards you to behold and hold you, precious. My kindness lays upon you and surrounds you. And when I fail, frail myself, I turn again and yet again to be gracious to you. I am inseparable from you for all time, from this life to the next and all that follow. I am inseparable from you, and it has been so, it is so, and will be forevermore.